my name is Andrew Branner. Um, I work for a company called MV5 Geospatial. Uh, we were previously known as Quantum Spatial, so you may know us as Quantum Spatial. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the company before we go into the uh, presentation. So what I'll be covering today, give a little bit on the company overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about remote sensing in general. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with remote sensing, but I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, are not experts in it. And so I'll sort of give you a little primer. Hopefully it won't be uh, too technical. Now I'm going to focus in on this concept of individual tree delineation and, and where I see it plays in the environment that we're working in. And I'm sure that many of you understand, we'll, we'll work out how it fits in with the types of things that you do. And I'll um, talk a little bit about applications. As I said, we used to be called Quantum Spatial. We are a geospatial firm and we do everything from collecting source data so we collect imagery. We have around 12 planes. We fly over large parts of the country and we collect aerial imagery. We also collect thermal imagery and we can collect hyperspectral imagery. And then we also collect a technology called LIDAR, which some of you may be familiar with. In fact, the new iPhone 12 has a LIDAR sensor on it. And really, it measures distance. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works. But what we do is use those uh, sort of the, the LIDAR um, laser to measure objects in space. Um, it gives us the three, three dimensions um, that allows us to characterize what's on the ground. And then we take those data and we convert it into information. And then we build systems that manage that information. Uh, we are national in scope. We do have a Canadian office and we are, we cover, really do projects all over the U.S. We break our idea, our, our discipline down into three parts. We acquire data, the, the stuff that I just referenced. We analyze it and then we answer questions. As we go through this, what I'd like you to do is think about what questions you're trying to ask. So where are the invasive species? Where should, we, um, where should we protect the wetlands? Where should we plant trees? What's the impact on a particular uh, mammal? And, and think about the data that you need to answer those questions. And then what we do is we work out what information, what source data will allow you to answer those questions. Just sort of to reiterate, we've, we, we actually, we've done a lot of work in Alaska. We cover large areas of the country in terms of the, the, the data sets that we collect. Um, and so irrespective of where a project is, we can fly there uh, within hours and collect the information that we want. So this sort of gives us a little bit of our core capabilities. Multi-spectral multi imagery, this is of an active volcano. Um, we get LIDAR, which gives us the elevation. We have topobathometric LIDAR, which allows us to look under the water. So we look just at the areas above the ground, but all, above, above, above the water line, but also areas um, in the water column. We collect thermal, um, and we can collect that. Um, this in, in, this, in this particular case, it's of a, a, a substation, so we can look at the thermal loss from that substation, but we can look, also look at thermal loss from buildings. We can also look at uh, temperature differences in water columns, and that's a lot of work we do, looks at micro habitat for fish based on the, the thermal signature. We, we build, there's a lot of uh, discussion right now about autonomous units, so UAVs or drones for collecting imagery, we also build little autonomous robots that allow you to go around, scan an area um, and say, is it functioning well? Or is it not functioning well? And then finally, we, you know, we create um, data sets from various imagery, hyperspectral imagery and LIDAR, and I'll be talking more about that. So in order to understand a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to sort of go take a step back. Um, some of this may be familiar to many of you and talk about remote sensing and what we're doing with remote sensing. So 
Really with remote sensing, what we're doing is measuring an object by not touching it. So right now, you are remote sensing your screen. So you're, you're not touching it. You're, under, you're looking at the colors and the shapes and you're creating an image. You're creating information from that. And that's really the principle of what we're doing in the remote sensing community. We uh, go out, we capture imagery, we capture LIDAR, and we use it to take measurements without touching it of the trees, of the ground, of the vegetation, of the water. Um, so, so, so it's something that we're all familiar with in a co concept. What we can do in remote sensing is very much um, gear, gear up computers that they can do the same thing over and over again. And if we were sitting here looking at this picture and trying to count the number of trees, we'd probably um, either get bored or forget the numbers by the time we got to 3000, right? So really what the remote sensing technology I'm talking about allows us to do is map large areas very quickly and relatively accurately. So when we're dealing with remote sensing, there's really three things that are critical to understand. And I'm gonna hit each one of these separately. The, the first thing is the source data, and that's really what are we analyzing in order to extract or create the information, the ge geographic information we're working on. And we're going to talk, and what I'll mainly be talking about is imagery and LIDAR. So that source data, the, and there's some elements, obviously, you know, all Im imagery is the same, not all LIDAR is the same, depending on the quality of the imagery and the LIDAR and the specifications will determine what you can get out of it. The second thing is the training data. So, so this stuff isn't magic. We don't just throw it all in the computer and the computer spits out the answers that we're looking for. We actually have to train the computer to understand what we're looking for. And so we have to bring to the computer examples of what we want to map. So in this case, we're particularly interested in trees, um, and so we need to identify different types of trees. So here's an oak tree, here's an ash tree, here's a birch tree, and we need to say where it is, right? So we can't say, oh, the, 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 there's, there's five ash trees in my garden, but I don't, I don't know where they are. The, the computer won't be able to find that. The other things that we want to, may want to know about a tree, maybe it's its height, uh, it maybe it's canopy area, it may be its basal area. It may be the amount of carbon stored into it. Again, there's no magic here. We have to train the computer on that. And so we have to bring to the table a large amount of training data of what actually exists on the ground. So what we're doing is we don't eliminate the need for field work. Field work is really important. But what we're able to do with remote sensing is extrapolate from that field work to a much larger area, something that we wouldn't ever be able to do if we were just boots on the ground. So really the source data and the training data are the uh, two of the key areas. The third area is the, the way that we combine these two data together. And we use um, basically a series of classification routines and everyone's got their favorite routine and everyone claims their routine is better than the next guy's routine. But to a large extent, the quality of the source data and the training data are what makes the quality of that classification. Traditionally, we think of these in terms of supervised and unsupervised classifications. So supervised is where we bring to the table the training data um, and we tell it to classify into a class. Unsupervised is when the, we say, computer, tell us the variation, and then we go out and work out what that variation characterizes. Recently, there's been a huge step forward in applying machine learning or artificial intelligence type routines to this classification. And so that's where this uh, discipline is going and it's providing some really interesting results. In terms of bringing imagery to the table, there's really four resolutions that we need to think about. One is spectral, is one the way we sort of think about usually. Uh, we look at the electromagnetic spectrum here, and we have we each of these, uh, we have a, a wavelength of, of which we will capture, the sensor will capture, capture the brightness of that, the really the reflectance from the top of the vegetation. Second one is spatial resolution 
which is how big that individual pixel is. The third one is temporal resolution, which is how often you can capture the data. And the fourth one is data resolution, which really relates to whether you're dealing with an 8-bit image or whether you're dealing with a 16-bit image. And probably most people know understand what that means. One of the key things is this electromagnetic spectrum that we play with. Now, we, we generally, well, we always see in this visible light spectrum, uh, we've evolved to see in that spectrum, it's really between 400 nanometers, 700 nanometers, um, with green light at the 500 nanometers. But the sensors that we have can go outside that. And what we really are interested in, um, often from a vegetation perspective, is this area, the near infrared area here. Um, but we also may be interested a little further out. And then gradually, as we go out through the, the longer wavelengths, we start to get into the thermal and we start to get into microwave. And, you know, you probably hear about uh, radio waves from set remote sensing from from this from in astrophysics. So really what we're doing is just tailing tailoring the sensor to pick up what we're really interested in. We can get, see different things when we look in different wave bands, and particularly uh, most people are familiar with the near infrared. Um, if you ever see an area where the vegetation is red, that is usually in that well, that will indicate what you've got the uh, near infrared band replacing the blue band, and so it allows us to look at vegetation um, health and the types of vegetation. In terms of spatial resolution, um, a lot of us are getting seeing better and better spatial resolution. So these are really the pixel sizes, um, three to six inches. You tend to find in the city aerials as we as we um, increase the size of the area, at states state size. We're usually at about one foot. Uh, the National Agricultural Imagery Program is at 60 centimeters, and then commercial satellites are now down to. 30 centimeters, which is pretty incredible. And then um, a lot of free data is available at the 10 to 30 meter scale. And obviously, depending on the scale you're looking at, will, will influence how, what object you're looking at, look, what object you can identify. At three inch, you can identify much smaller objects, individual, individual trees, individual elements on the landscape, as opposed to 30 meter, where you're looking at really just What's the what's the average of that that area? The other thing to think about when you're looking for the imagery and it will influence what you can see is the temporal resolution. If you have multiple times that you collect the imagery, you allows it gives you more information for doing the classification. This is a picture of downtown Ann Arbor um, with the leaves off, and so from that it's very easy to classify where all the uh, impervious are because we have you no. Know, no canopy on the trees. Uh, if we take the same image in the summer, we got a lot of tree canopy, and therefore that tree canopy blocks a lot of the impervious underneath it. And so the impervious looks very different. In this case, we're looking at a large amount of woody vegetation. So depending on what you want to do, uh, what you want to classify, you've got to pick that th that time temporal um, that timing is very important. LiDAR has sort of been a game changer in the remote sensing area, especially when it comes to forestry, because it gives us the height element that we've been looking for, very difficult to get out of um, standard um, ortho imagery. LiDAR is basically um, a sensor that we attach to an aircraft. We shoot laser beams down upon the landscape and we measure the time it gets from the sensor to the ground and then back up. And if we know where we're looking and we know um, where we are, in, in, where that sensor is, we can identify the X, Y location on the ground. And with the time, we can identify the Z value, so the height. And that allows us to, um, allows us to measure the height and it allows us to understand something like canopy because the light beam, maybe it's a, around a 40, a centimeter diameter um, disc will reflect off some parts of the canopy and then will penetrate other parts. And so from that, it starts to give us some inf information on the, the structure of that canopy, which is really important for forestry. 
To show you the type of information we get back from a LIDAR sensor, um, we can see here the red is the one and only. So here we've got a bare, bare, bare ground, hits the ground, um, reflects back. So there's one return. We also have times when we hit the top of the canopy and it, all the energy reflects back. But sometimes the energy gets through. So this is the blue is the first of many. So it means we, we got it hitting the canopy, bouncing back, but some then penetrating through that canopy. The green is the second and third, and the yellow is the last of many. So we, what we want is the energy from the LIDAR sensor to hit the ground so we can map the ground, but it also the amount of canopy there will determine how many returns we get from that LIDAR point. And that, as you can see, we're starting to see that structure. So if we look at something called the pulse density, which is really how many pulses per sec, how many pulses per square meter hit a shot out of the plane, um, this is one of the key characteristics of LIDAR. And so this, I'm gonna show you a series of, as the density increases, and you're gonna to start to see this is the same areas. This is two points per square meter. We can see sort of a amorphous canopy developing here, and we can see a couple of spots that get through to the ground. If we go up to four points, we can start to see a little bit better, but still not great definition of the trees, few more points hitting the ground. If we hit up at 10 points, we can now start to see individual tree canopy peaks, right? And we can start to see some penetration, more penetration to the ground. We can start to see some, uh, some sort of uh, noise that hits the ground that might relate to um, dead woody material on the ground. Then as we jump up to 20 points per square meter, we're starting to see the branching structure of the um, canopy. We can see the tops of the canopy. We can see a better definition of the ground. And at 40 points per square meter, we start to see a really good definition of the ground, of oh, sorry, of the canopy. And then we can also see these individual trees, tree trunks starting to reflect the data too, and, and also information about the ground. So, as we change, as we increase the point density, we can start to see that we get more and more information about that canopy. Obviously, the cost increases also because we're flying slower, we're flying uh, more flight lines. So there's a balance between the information that you get and the and the price. That sort of gives you that's your primer on remote sensing. Um, what I want to do now is talk about how we're using this information for identifying individual trees. Um, this information has been used in forestry for, well, pretty much since it started. In fact, foresters were really some of the first people to adopt this technology because it is so useful in giving us that height that tells us a lot about that tree or tree growth. So the question is, why would we want to map individual trees? It's, it's really you know, a crazy idea if you, you probably have never seen an individual tree map um, so why would we do it? We'd like to block trees together. So it is a bit of a crazy idea. Um, for many, many applications, um, people simply um, don't need to know e what each individual tree is doing. But there are many applications where individual trees um, are, are critical to actually what's go understanding what's going on in a forest. And, and that's because really, when we get down to it, the basic unit in a forest is the tree. I mean, what we do is we average all the trees together into stands because we can't deal with the, date, the level of detail of an individual tree. But when we're trying to understand what happens in a forest, we measure individual trees, we harvest individual trees, we grow individual trees and individual trees grow at different rates. And it, from a wildlife perspective, it's what, what you know what a, a squirrel looks like looks at or a marten looks like or a lynx looks like they don't look at a forest they look for individual trees and so understanding what's happening at individual tree level makes a lot of sense when you start to look at the processes for most production forestry purposes they sample the forest but that's mainly because it's practical right it has been previously impractical to to measure and map individual trees. But now we have the technology to actually take a census instead of a sample. If we think about how few trees we usually sample when we try to assess a forest, um, 
you know, that we know very precisely what's on a very small area of ground, but we really have very little idea of what's happening on the rest of the ground. And this gives us an opportunity to understand what's happening at the, at the large level. So I'm going to show you a couple of methods that we use. This is sort of the start with sort of what we call a geometric approach. It's really the it's really the simplest approach to delineating trees, and it works really well for conifers. Um, as and you'll see why. So you start identifying the tips of the trees, and then we we so we look at tips here and tip here and tip here, and we identify search within that tip where the next next maximum is. And then we can then basically create a, a map that identifies where that tree is relative to its adjacent trees. And so we can start to identify using the idea that most trees are conical, um, at least the conifers are conical, and therefore relate, relate, relate to this relatively well. The problem comes in broadleaves that often have very different shapes. From this, we can identify individual trees. We can identify, we'll see whether they're dominant. We can characterize the environment they're in, what sort of slope they're on, what elevation, what aspect. And we can compile this information into an easily accessible GIS uh, format. So this gives you a little example of what a, uh, a geometric approach would show you. This is a, area in Alaska, um, obviously dominated by conifer trees. We can see the, the bare earth here. We can see the trees, this sort of three-dimensional picture. And then we can use this routine to identify each individual tree across the landscape. And this works pretty well for a lot of conifers. Once we've got that individual tree information, we then start extracting things related to that tree. So what we want to do is try to characterize that tree with the information we've got. And so we have things, and I'll show you in the next slide a little more detail, but we have structural metrics from the LIDAR. We have spectral metrics from the imagery. We have site metrics from the, from the ground, and we have competition metrics um, related to one tree related to its next, next neighbor. And so what we need is we need a reliable tree segmentation so that when we're applying these metrics, we're applying them associated with the actual tree we're interested in rather than a mix of trees. Um, as I said, you know, in conifers, it classifies very well. In broadleaves, it do, this geometric approach doesn't classify quite as well. And the other thing that we have to recognize is that we don't capture things we can't see. So we can't capture the subdominant and understory trees. But a lot of things people are interested in is the dominant. So we use those metrics and we create information on the tree variables of interest, be that biomass, a basal area, timber. In terms of metrics, um, there are uh, hundreds of metrics for each of these uh, particular groups of metrics. And you know, there's academics coming up with new ones every day. So there's a whole lot of site metrics. It could be elevation, slope, aspect, uh, slope position, soil type, wetness, habitat classification. There's a whole lot of spectral metrics related to brightness, uh, band ratios, texture, edge detection. And then there's some new ones which are related to competition. So, you know, how is that, how does that canopy relate to the adjacent canopies? So view to sky, distance to neighbor, where they are in the canopy dominance and stuff like that. And then there's all the LIDAR metrics that we talked about that often we look at the height percentiles or the canopy diameter or the canopy volume or the variance or ketosis. Um, and as I said, there's, there's hundreds for each of these that you can put into your analysis. Now, one of the challenges that we have is how do we bring all the data that we've got into the same area? And, and this is a relatively new challenge because we're usually in remote sensing not working at the level of precision that um, we need to work at in order to classify individual trees. And so what, what, if you collect imagery and LIDAR at the same time, then it's usually you've got more ability to align the data. If they're collected separately, there's a whole set of reasons why the, the imagery and the LIDAR 
may not match up. And so a lot of the classifications rely just on the LIDAR and not integrating the imagery, but we've been looking into that and trying to bring these, in, these two data sets together because the LIDAR gives us structure, the imagery gives us information on species and health. So the approach that we've taken is usually when we're creating imagery from what we call ortho photos, where we're creating, mashing all the imagery together, we use the ground to rectify the data to create that flat surface from, for the data. The problem is that trees are above the ground. And so um, with the way that you'll see, uh, and you may see, have seen it in many of the, the aerial photography you know, that you've looked at, is you may see buildings leaning over, or you may see trees leaning over. Um, and that's a result of the process that, that is, that's used for creation of those ortho photos. Now, in most cases, that's not a big problem. You can correct for it. But if you want to get the right pixel on the right point, then you have to pay a lot more attention to this. And so what we've done is developed a method that allows us to create what we call a true ortho. In other words, you know, if the imagery is captured from the vertical, then you're fine. But as soon as you're capturing imagery from a slant, you've got to do a correction. And so we have the LIDAR point cloud. And what we, what we then do is track back onto each original frame where that, we call it ray tracing, where that ray would be on the original image. So you don't have to understand all the, the details about it, but basically here's a point cloud. And then we've got one frame on one side and one frame on the other side. And the yellow indicates the points that are colorized with, with the frame on the right hand side. And the red indicate the points that color, colorized with the image on the left hand side. Normally you just have a, a stripe down the middle and this would all be yellow and that would be, be red. Um, but by, by using this process of ray tracing, we're able to correct for the lean in the, in the imagery. Just, and just to show you what I mean here, this, this is an original ortho photo. Here's the seam line down the middle. And just look at these two um, circles here. So this is, this is the way it would normally be viewed. And this is using the ray tracing method. So we got this tree here, right, from the LIDAR. And look at the red, red circle here. If we move back to the ortho, that tree moves. Now, if you, if you don't care really about where the trees are, you won't, this won't disturb you very much. But if you're trying to map the trees, this is a problem. So your LIDAR may be here, but you're, being, you're colorizing the LIDAR with, the, with, the, with the, the gap, right? So if you look at that, that's the tree top um, and that's the gap. Down here, we can see we have, this is the ray traced LIDAR, ray traced imagery. We can see we have a whole tree there. So now you see it and now you don't. So when, because of the seam line and because of the lean on the imagery, we start losing trees. Now, again, these are small things if you're not interested in the trees, but if you're actually interested in the trees, this starts to make a difference. So we've been using this method to, to build really the best source data that we can. And what we've been doing is using machine learning methods, which are different, um, significantly different from the traditional methods of classification that require, that basically rely on standard statistical approaches. Uh, machine learning, and you've probably been hearing about this in a lot of other disciplines, it takes as many examples of reality and then basically runs it through a system that learns that optimizes it so it's predicting what it sees. And so to do that, we have, we need as much field data as we can get. We often need more field data than we would under normal circumstances, but it then becomes a self-learning uh, system that you can feed it more and more information and it can give you better and better answers. And we've been doing that with automata models where we actually learn and predict where we think the stems, the tree stem is and where the canopy edge is um, and it grows out the individual trees. So the first method I showed you is this geometric where you look at the treetops. This one is basically you say, give me an example of 10,000 trees and all these trees will be real trees 
And so we're not working off some idealized version of the canopy. We're working off real data. And this we found gives us much better information on the more complex systems such as broadleaves. And so we're able to f create these final crown boundaries, and you can see a few of this, by using this self-learning algorithm. So this gives you an example of, this is an area in Louisville, um, which is a project we actually worked on to look at the health value of trees. And they're looking particularly for individual species. So these, this is the uh, three-dimensional trees. And this is using that self-learning mechanism. We identify the trees, we identify where the, uh, the species of the trees. So zoom in of the same area. And here we'll just sort of go in, you can start to see how the level of detail that we're getting on those individual trees. So if you think of it from an urban tree manager, we now know the size, the shape, the status, the health of those individual trees. Um, and then this is just a zoom in on that, on an individual tree. So you can see the level of information we have associated with a tree, if we, we could then work out, okay, this tree has a certain amount of, uh, of, of leaf, of dead material on that, and we can sort of identify that and bring that inf information into our analysis system. So we can look at urban tree death, we can look at disease, we can look at invasive species. So I'm gonna wrap up this by looking at a few applications, uh, forest inventory, uh, timber harvest, wildlife, tree health, dead trees, urban tree management. And these are some of the things that we can use this for. Now, a lot of people will say, we don't really need individual trees, but just like we none of us needed cell phones, for those who can still remember pre-cell phones, we survived fine without cell phones, but now you try to find someone who can survive without a cell phone. Uh, I believe that this technology, once it's out there, people will uh, want to use it all the time. So forest inventory, now I just quickly run through this. Uh, basically we take the uh, plot data, we have the individual trees delineated within that plot. We have all the metrics that we're talking about associated with that. We then summarize the plot information. We have our independent variables, which is the, this information, and we can then create a map of all the variables that we're interested in, be it biomass, basal area, quadratic mean diameter, et cetera, uh, for forest inventory. And as I said, most companies now are using this type of approach to create their forest inventory, or at least moving in that direction. We can also use it for wildlife. Wildlife, I think, has um, a lot of potential wildlife management, a lot of potential in this area, because wildlife doesn't see a stand of trees, it sees an individual tree with an individual characteristic. So we can identify mast trees, we can identify dead trees, we can identify trees that have a certain characteristic, and then we can see how many other things are within a certain distance of that tree. And if, if anyone who's done wildlife management understands that the relative position of different resources is sort of critical to the survival of many species. Invasive species, um, this is some work that we're doing down in Southern California where we're looking at the polyphagus shot hole borer and its impact on urban trees. And we've been using this information to identify species of trees across this area so that they can be assessed for their health and they can be assessed for their species so that they can be protected from the uh, shot hole borer and a number of other uh, invasive species that are out there. And so you can identify very quickly which of the trees that you should be in interested in. So these are the target trees. Snags, snags are dead trees and snags can be detected from the LIDAR. And this is just using the LIDAR and this is some work from, done by the Forest Service in the Pacific Northwest, where they were looking for individual snags, snags being a very important part of the, of the ecosystem for, especially for uh, cavity nesting birds and some mammals. And so identifying the, the snags pre-fire, these are the pre-fire snags, this is the whole system 
and then after a fire identifying the new number of snags so very useful information for wildlife biologists and then getting some really detailed information on both the species size distribution health of urban trees uh, for that urban tree management a lot of urban tree managers know what's on public land but have very little understanding of what's on private land this allows provision of that information so to wrap up i've thrown a lot of information at you and and uh, you know feel free to contact me outside the session too if there's more details you're interested in but really look at remote sensing as one of the tools that can help you answer the question so if we go back to the original choir analyze answer you are the people who have the questions you want answered let's look at what information you need and then from that we can put together the suite of of technologies that will answer that will create the data to answer that question. The fact, you know, I've been doing this over 30 years and I am every day blown away by the availability of better data for creating the information we want. It, it is really incredible the variation and the quality of information that is out there for creating these types of maps down to the fine scale. And what we're able to do if we get the right source data and we have good training data, we can use that to uh, give us the answers.